بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سورہ بنی اسرائیل چیپٹر سیونٹین اینڈ وی ول کور ورسز تھرٹی نائن ٹو فورٹی سکس دا قرآن پرووائڈز کمپلیٹ گائیڈنس ٹو مین کائنڈ اینڈ وی ول ریفلیکٹ آن سم آف دیز آسپیکٹس ٹو ڈے بیکاز دیر آر فیو ورسز آن دس آن دس ٹاپک دیز آر دا ریفرنسز اینڈ دس از آر کانٹیکٹ ان کیس دیر از اے کویشچن آر کوئری on any of the points raised in today's presentation or any of our previous presentations. Recap verses 17, 31-38 The system of deen needs to take care of children in the land and this should include all aspects of sustenance, education, training and self-development. When the system is not yet in place, this should be kept in view during the transition period. All choices and decision making needs to be guided by the permanent values. One such aspect is related to the education and conduct regarding sexual activity, which is for the purpose of the continuity of the human race. It should remain within the confines of a marital life and aim to guard against any promiscuity through education, training and discipline. People who transgress need to be held accountable. And this accountability is a must because otherwise such activity which takes place outside the mar marital domain then causes problem widely in any society, in any nation, even in the world. Because these things don't remain confined to one family or two individuals, these have a bad effect on the society in general. Because whatever wrong we do, it does have effect on rest of us. Human life must be respected and the unlawful killing of any human being must be dealt with through justice and fairness. The system should take care of all aspects of this and ensure that justice is done to the heirs of the victim. And we remember that this, is, this aspect in this verse was related to one human being. And what is going on in the world is that thousands of being, beings are being killed on a regular basis. Business dealings should be honest and transparent and regulated through proper rules and codes of practice. The education system should promote acquisition of knowledge through the use of the senses and cognitive abilities. People should be encouraged to keep well informed about the state of affairs within society and the world at large. Because if we don't have knowledge, then how are we going to deal with it? The solutions can only be found once we have knowledge of all the problems which exist around us. They should be fully conversant with Quranic precepts and their application, so that they have a knowledge-based self which cannot be influenced by man-made systems and its manipulations. An overview of today's presentation. Allah has provided guidance through the Quran, that is Wahi, so that man can make correct choices in life and thus can avoid the pitfalls of his worldly life. He should never mix man-made laws with the laws and values of the Qur'an, otherwise he will not obtain those benefits which are associated with Qur'anic teaching. This, is, this point Qur'an repeats again and again. The reason is that it is the very fundamental principle of the Qur'an that we should not mix man-made laws with Allah's laws. If we want to get maximum benefit from the formula of the Qur'an, then we have to remain within it. The Quran is a complete book of guidance and this fact should not be accepted mechanically. Acceptance should be through rational thinking and reasoning. Only then can it help to acquire that psyche which can establish the system of deen. The whole system of the universe follows the laws of Allah. Man should also use his choice and intent and opt for the Quranic values to bring balance and order into his worldly life. Just like the balance and order in the universe. And Quran draws our attention to this aspect by picking up signs from the outer world and then telling us that you can also get balance and order in your own world. Those who follow the Quran can identify those who are not interested in its guidance by employing the signs noted in it. As these are related to the human psyche, hence they need to develop their own selves first in order to judge others using the Quranic criteria. Those who do not consider the Quran to be a complete book of guidance, they display their antipathy to it through their words and conduct.
Let us go to the first verse of today's presentation, 1739. Wahi of Allah explains its own significance. Zalika mimma awha ilaika rabbuka minal hikmate. Wala taj al maal lahe ilahan akhara fatulka fi jahannama maluman madhura. This is that implicit wisdom of affairs, that is ethical values, which is sent to you as wahi from your Rabb. For you, the fundamental principle of life is that you should not accept the rule of anyone other than Allah. Be obedient to only His commands and laws. Do not associate any other entity of authority with Him. If you do this, accept someone else as possessor of authority other than Allah. A very important point because we only follow those laws whom we consider that he or she is the authority or that government is the authority for us and we accept their rule. So if we do not follow what Quran has given us, that means that we do not consider that Allah has any authority in the, in the human world. Then its consequence will be that you will decline from the status of humanity become cursed in all kinds of ways and plunge condemned into the depths of Jahannam. And we can see this Jahannam all around us in the world of 2024. The Quran contains all the guidance which is required for Rububiyat. As we know, the Quran also describes the reason and rationale behind every one of its commands, values, attributes, principles and precepts so that we can reflect on these and then figure out the associated benefits within the context of the system of deen. Here attention is drawn to this fact that Zalika mimma awha laika rabbuka minal hikmate. That all these commands and guidance, guidelines are revealed for the system of rububiyat and are based on hikmat. Hikmat means that everything which is explained in the Quran, the reason for that command is also explained. And we have to cross check it as well because Quran does mention one aspect at one in one verse and then it goes on to reflect, ask us to reflect on another aspect of the same principle or same uh, law. Since these are from your Rabb, hence they need your careful attention if you wish to draw benefit from this Quran. Since these are pure and complete, do not contaminate any of their aspects with your own desires and proclivities. The important point is that initially, of course, we can look at the Quran with our own doubts and suspicions, but gradually as we overcome these, uh, these inclinations and deal with the Quranic values based on facts and evidence around us, then a stage comes where we are fully committed to the Quran and that is where the Iman comes in that our conviction is absolutely firm without any doubt and we know that 100% if we follow the Quran, it will take us to that point where it promises to take us as far as this life is concerned. And of course the life goes beyond death, so it will take us on the path of further development beyond death. If you resort to any contamination through your own inventions and tampering, then you will not be able to benefit from the Quran and the consequences will appear in the shape of turning your word into hell. And what I have done over here is I have put down some of the comments in the light of the presenting evidence in the world around us and we can see all of it and even more than this. For example, bloodshed, chaos, conflicts, wars, fear, huzan, and huzan takes into account all types of griefs and depressions and anxieties. Imbalances, injustices, tyranny, killings, murders, crimes of every kind, promiscuity, violence, child abuse, slavery of all kinds, exploitation, lies flying all around. And we can see that on being displayed on modern media. Mutual accusations and wranglings, whole media is full of these accusations and, and all these disputes. Wasting precious time on meaningless discussions and arguments. Living life under these conditions cannot lead to success in the hereafter. Further elaboration of this verse, let us analyze the verse in reverse order. And this thought came to my mind that let us see that how the, word, how the verse reads if we take it in an inverse order. And the verse concludes by saying, Fatulka fi jahannama maluman madhura. 
If you make a choice to live a life of hell in which you do not wish to bring out your latent potentials with which you are born, then you need to live a life full of mutual recriminations and condemning each other on a continuous basis. And we can look at these two words, Malum and Madhura, their uh, roots, and we will see there is a lot more to it. So if we want a word the way the word is as of today, then this is what we should do and what the, this verse is telling us. What should we do? In the above case, what you should then do is That is, follow the man-made laws and reject Allah totally. Don't have to even read the Quran. Just leave the Quran on one side and get used to the world in which you are living because you have made a choice to live in this world. Never obey the laws of Allah in your domain and instead create your own laws or mix the two laws, i.e. some man-made laws and some laws of Allah which conform to your desires. So the point over here is that it is our choice, what kind of a world we want. In this way, you will acquire that psyche which will lead you to creating a world full of chaos, disorder, imbalance. Living life like this may give some of you some benefits of this physical life, but it will never let you possess a developed self which can live beyond physical death. Because developed self can only come into play when firstly we have recognized that there is a self within us which has the capacity, which has the potential to go beyond death. And then we look at its needs and then say that the Quranic path is for us. So if we do not even recognize the presence of this self and the world in which we are living, which is a man-made world, and we are quite happy with that, then of course all of this is meaningless. Keep in mind that this is Allah's universe and eternal success can only come by following his laws. And then we come to the front part of the verse. All of the above has been detailed in the Quran, which is based on Zalika Mimma Oha Alaika Rabbaka Minal Hikmate, i.e. in order to achieve the best out of the traits of choice and intent, Allah as Rabb has revealed the Quran which provides knowledge about the pitfalls of human life and appeals to the rational mind so that man can get the best out of his worldly life. So if we don't want and we want to live in hell the way we have created through our own intellect and emotions and through our own deeds, then we don't need wahi from Allah. And all of this Rabba Kamin al Hikmate is meaningless for human beings because they don't want it. Human intellect needs the guidance of Wahi, otherwise it goes astray as his base desires cannot lead him to his destination which is defined by Rububiyat. Now let us go to the next verse, 1740. Ensure wrong thoughts do not get access to your mind. Afa asfakum rabbukum bil banina wattakhaza min al malaikate nasan innakum la takuluna kaulan azima. This is the fundamental principle of deen, i.e. that authority and control in the universe belongs only to Allah and not anyone else. And we don't need a lot of evidence for that. It is all around us. And it is this very thing that these ignorant, superstitious people cannot understand. And th this is where the duty of the Quranic uh, students come in that they should explain to others after understanding it themselves. It is their belief that there are many gods and goddesses who are included in the rule of Allah. Furthermore, that Allah also has progeny who help him in his affairs and that the angels are his daughters. Ask them that, has your Rabb specified sons for yourselves and has made the Malaika daughters for himself? How greatly erroneous this utterance is which you bring on your tongue without thinking. If we remember, this aspect was also covered under Surah Nahal, 1657, and we might like to have a look on that talk as well. Further reflections on this verse, 1740. We know that within the domain of religious belief systems, all types of wrong things are attributed to and included in the concepts of God, which human minds have invented. Since these affect the human psyche, the Quran pointed out these wrong concepts and invited us to think again in order to benefit from its guidance. And we know Quran does point to us that what kind of false concepts existed in that Arabian society. And even in today's society, despite all the development and modern technology, human beings being the same still hold on to quite wrong concepts 
which are not rational at all. Here the erroneous belief linked to Malaika is quoted and the people are asked to logically question this, whether it has any relevance to the factual concept of Allah, which is based on his attributes, which help to transform ourselves. And the point to which Quran points our attention is that by holding on to these beliefs within our cognitive makeup, don't think that these will not affect you. These things do affect us because these go into subconscious and then the subconscious affects our conscious level of existence. And as a result, we cannot bring out all those latent potentials which are kept within us and the, which can only be brought out through the guidance of the Quran. To some, this may appear to be a minor issue, but by mentioning Rab here, the Quran has asked us to reflect on this aspect since it affects the human psyche, which simply cannot be of any use to the system of Rububiyat if it has concocted these kind of beliefs. And it is a fact, all those people who hold on to such beliefs, the Quran can never reveal itself on them as a system of deen. They will read it, but they will never understand the importance of deen and as a result, all these things remain, they remain oblivious to it and they do not get any benefit from the Quran as far as this life is concerned. The verse concludes by stating, Inna kum la kaulan azima. These thoughts and words have a massive effect on the human psyche and such an outlook can never benefit from this life. And these are important points because over here Quran says Kaulan Azima that this is something not to be taken lightly. It has great effect on human psyche which cannot understand the system of Deen and Rububiyat which is explained in the Quran. Next verse 1741, the Quranic layout facilitates analytical learning for the self-development. وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَا فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لِيَذَكَّرُوا وَمَا يَزِيدُهُمْ إِلَّا نُفُورًا And we have adopted various styles in the Qur'an to illuminate the reality and we keep presenting various aspects in different ways so that the realities become crystal clear. And we can see over here, Sarrafna, that is through Tasrif al-Ayat, we can understand the Qur'an because different aspects are covered in different parts of the Quran, we have to bring them all together. And that is why we cannot pick and choose from the Quran, we have to take it as a whole from beginning to the end as a system of deen. And within that context, then things fall in place and that is what is important for understanding the system of Rububiyat. But those people who have made up their minds that we are going to oppose this, come what may, there will be no effect on them from this. Rather, their hatred increases even more as a result. And this happens because people pick and choose. They take out those aspects which suit them and then they just keep following it, not looking at the whole Quran and where those aspects fit in. Expanding these meanings further. After listing a number of important aspects of the duties of Mu'mineen, here the Qur'an sums it up by stating that this book contains all the guidance which is required to transform this life of ours. If we keep in mind verse 21.10, which says, لَقَدًا زَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Surely we have revealed for you a book in which is a message of eminence for you. That is for each one of us and not only individually, but collectively as well. Will you then use your akal? And so Quran puts a lot of emphasis on using our rational and reasoning side to look at the verses and see how these affect human psyche. Then we can relate its various precepts to our own psyche. The outer world will only change when we manage to change our inner world, i.e. all the aspects of our psyche which contribute to dissonances and conflicts within us. A conflicted and divided mind which is not precise about its aim of life simply cannot get that benefit from the Quran which is related to bringing out our best by developing our potentials. Because if we keep looking at others, then we are not going to benefit from the Qur'an. The way to benefit from the Qur'an is to look inwards, that what all I have, what all potentials I have, and what else I have to which the Qur'an is pointing our attention to. 
because that is how we can benefit from it. And that is how when we come together, we become an effective member of that team because each team is fully developed, very solid, concrete in their outlook. And they have a firm Iman in the values of the Quran. Because if we waver, then we affect not only our own self, but we also weaken the team. Let us look at the verse in parts. We have explained aspects of human life in the Quran so that they can get the best out of it for their own eminence in this life and the life beyond this. Now, continuing on this verse 1741, despite presently living under man-made systems, we can benefit from the guidance of the Quran intellectually as well as in practical life. Bringing about a change in our psyche is only possible when we feel the need for this. And in order to do this, we need to overcome those emotive and intellectual proclivities which prevent us from getting to the heart of the message. Proclivities over here means those inclinations within us, those desires within us, those that outlook which we possess at a point in time. What exactly is that and how do our desires affect it? In verse, Inna Allaha la yugayiru ma bi kaumin hatta yugayiru ma bi anfusihim. We have gone through this verse. Allah does not change the state of a nation or people until they bring about a change in their own psyche. I.e. the change in the outer world is directly proportional to the change occurring within each one of us. For example, if we wish to acquire understanding of the system of deen and then work for it, we need to acquire that self which is developed within the domain of the permanent values and divine attributes. So that means if we do not understand some of the aspects of the Quran, when we are going through it, we need to raise the level of self-development so that we start to understand it. And for that, the formula given by the Quran is to bring out our own best by doing salih deeds. For these two steps are intrinsically linked, i.e. first we should have Iman and I've just quoted this verse. It's an important verse because there are a lot of important aspects covered in it as cause and effect. And then as a consequence of this Iman to carry out Salih deeds, we can then evaluate the level of our self-development using the criteria clearly signposted in the Quran from beginning to end. And when we say criteria, it means that wherever Quran says, this is how Mominin behave, this is how Salihin behave, this is the way Mohsenin behave, then we should look at all that criteria and see that how much of it we are reflecting from our own personality and how much we are lacking. And then we should make an effort, not creating stress for ourselves, our anxiety for ourselves, but within the man-made system, we can do a lot to bring out our best. Continuing further with this verse, then the verse concludes with an interesting fact, Bama yuziduhum illa nafura. This is a beautifully worded uh, verse where Quran says that these people, when the message of Quran is passed on to them, what increases is not anything about the Quran, but they want to run away from it. Instead of coming to the Quran, they create a distaste for it. Instead, people respond to something which is for their own benefit. It only increases their flight from the Quran, which is Haq. Why do they do this? So I thought to put down some comment on this aspect as well. Here we need to pause and if reflect. In order to understand the human psyche and its inclinations, unbridled human desires do not like being curtailed by anyone. And people are unwilling to consider any option which impinges on their desires when they carry out a cost-benefit analysis. And this is something very interesting that why did Allah create us like that? These aspects, Allah knew that human beings are going to behave like that. Then why did he create us like that? And this the answer we have to find ourselves from the Quran as well as from the presenting evidence around us. That if something has become very obvious to us as students of the Quran, why it is not still obvious to others? And that gap we have to fill and that gap has to be understood in the human psyche. Because unless we understand that, we can't feel comfortable in the world in which we are living. If they see a benefit, then they are willing to alter their choice. And there is a very strong 
proclivity to fulfilling our desires kept within human beings. And human beings will never give up their desire unless they are presented with something better than that or more advantageous and beneficial to them. The Quran does not offer any immediate benefit to people, especially when the man-made systems are fully entrenched in the world. And this is a very important point for the students of the Quran that why people don't find attraction towards the Quran and even those who study the Quran, read the Quran, do not see the system of deen because they think that this is impractical. This is not possible and that is why they say that this is the way word is supposed to be and we will just read the Quran for our own salvation or for some kind of a invisible swab. Then the Quran addresses the people who are in power and are wealthy, as the system cannot be changed unless those wishing to change it possess physical power. Obviously, people in a position of power will only opt to change if they are dissatisfied with the man-made systems of which they are the beneficiaries. The next question which comes to our mind is that if people do not want the system of deen, and we see it, there are plenty of them who have even read the Quran and they don't want the system of deen because deep down in the subconscious they know that if the system of deen comes, at least during the transition period, they will lose some of the benefits which are associated with the man-made system. Of course, they do not see yatim and miskeen. Then why do they read the Quran and spend time to worry about its words and their meanings? Few more reflections on this verse. The Quran has pointed to some of these aspects, helping us to comprehend the unbridled human psyche. An unbridled means which is not guided by the values of the Quran. Many assume that human life ends with physical death, hence there is no personal accountability and being the beneficiaries of the system, they do not wish to think about the problems facing humanity and the world. Thinking about human problems creates discomfort. And it is a fact. If we start thinking, for example, what is going on in Gaza, what is going on in Africa, what is going on in different parts of the world where there are conflicts created by human mind and human hands, then these will create some stress. And this is part of learning about the Quran, learning about the system of deen, because unless we feel the pain and anxiety and we become even annoyed about it, we are not going to get up and do something about it. And the Quran tells us that it can be addressed. Just come to the Quran, come together and start acquiring that psyche which is required for the system of deen and then see how things will start progressing, start developing in your favor. Another aspect which hinders their path is the religious belief system in which they are emotively satisfied that they are pleasing their God who will permit them to enter paradise. Such beliefs are, in fact, predicated on this false assumption that the fate of every human being is predecided, and this is related to the issue of takdir. And we can see this exists in every religion, because even in Christianity, they say that human beings, no human being can enter the paradise unless they have belief in Jesus Christ. And these kind of beliefs then give false hopes to people and they do not address the human issues squarely. Hence, by being the beneficiaries of the system, they are the favorites of their gods. And those gods' concepts they have created themselves. Then there are those to whom some aspects of the Quran appeal, for example, scientific facts, and they create an academic interest in this direction and spend the whole of their life pursuing this. They feel pleased with themselves that they are doing something positive and useful. Many study the Quran purely academically, not as a system to be implemented, and even memorize relevant parts of it and frequently quote these, but cannot convince themselves about the existence of a system within its folds. We can add more shares to this list. The Quran lumps every one of them together and declares, kafaru wa amaluhum. They all display kufr to the signs of rububiyat and as a consequence, their deeds go to waste. And that is important because if after reading the Quran, after studying the Quran, nothing has changed within our own psyche and we haven't really looked for those who are on this path already and come together and unite our hearts, 
then our deeds are going to go wasted because we will never have that kind of a psyche, that kind of a self to which the Quran is pointing our attention to. Next verse, 1742, there is unity of authority in the universe. Kullu kana mahu alihatun kama yakuluna izal labtagao ila zil arshe sabila. Say to them that these things about which you think that they have divine authority and control, if they really did possess authority and control, then these powers would have found ways to compete against that Allah who has central control of the universe. And if control had become divided, then chaos would have erupted in the universe. Whereas it is a fact that there is no chaos and disorder in the system of the universe anywhere. So the Quran presents evidence that there is unity of command, unity of sovereignty in the world, and that is through Allah's laws. Further reflections on this verse, 1742. We know that the Quran places great emphasis on Tawheed, i.e. one law giving authority in the universe which only belongs to Allah. Here a fact is quoted from the human world where if there is more than one ruler in a land, there is bound to be conflict and disorder. In fact, we can observe this in today's world where there are as many gods as there are countries and there are as many laws and constitutions with different laws in every nation state. People and rulers in every country are dis dissatisfied with their own system and are living life in a state of continuous criticism and accusation. Why do they do it? And this is an important point to which we have to continuously reflect. Because if Allah's concept is that which helps us to develop ourselves, and through that development we accept him as the only ruler, as the only giver, giver of laws in the world. And second is that the life of the hereafter exists, whether we like it or do not like it. And unless we bring that concept factually in our life, we can never ever come to the Quran. This is because no one knows the purpose of their own creation and the aim of their life. The latent potential for recognizing the Quranic guidance exists in the depths of their consciousness. But since it remains unexplored, hence people live a life which is unlived in the words of Eric Fromm. Very important that it becomes an unlived life because this is not the life which will give us that new life to, where, to which the Quran is pointing our attention to. Not that Eric Fromm believed in the Quran or in, in, in the way of Allah. But what he said was that we are somehow not bringing out our best. So whatever he observed based on evidence, he saw that people do not bring out their best. And there are some interesting YouTube videos where we can look at what he says. The verse then invites us to seek ways to understand the authority and rule of Allah through the Quran, the only path through which mankind can relieve itself from fear and huzan. Next verse, 1743, understand the correct concept of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yakuluna aluvan kabira. It is clear from this that whatever these people say about Allah, Allah is far above all this, very lofty and master of every kind of authority and control. In the universe, supremacy belongs only to him. And this is not something which Allah is praising about himself. This is a fact. This is the way it is meant to be. And this is the way Allah wants us to understand the human world, the, the universe around us so that we can benefit from it in terms of our own self's development. Forming a correct concept of Allah leads to understanding the Quran as a system. Through verses like this, Allah is not trying to impress us, not at all. And we should never take it as some kind of a praise to which Allah is resorting to, to impress us. If we we know that the Quran is for our own eminence and loftiness. And if we look at these verses from that aspect, then we will see that there is a lot in these verses for our self-development. And it expands our consciousness. It expands our vision. It gives us access to those areas where man-made system can never ever give us access to. 
As we have seen, the Quran is for achieving that eminence and loftiness of character for which we are created as human beings possessing choice and intent. We need to analyze these verses with that context in mind. Let us analyze it by looking at the typical contents of a human psyche which is non-Quranic. And I put it down, though we have gone through this aspect previously as well, but it is good to remind ourselves and then for some of us who are going to see this presentation for the first time, it will help them to reflect. Ask anyone about the criteria for success. For example, in our world, we should ask each other and, and those people who haven't come to the Quran that how do you define success in the world or success in your life? And these will include their own education, their family, job, wealth, car, house, country. That is affinity for land because that is the deep down affinity that people want to hold on to some piece of land. Miscellaneous material possessions, religious beliefs, very important. They will, they will give up everything but will never compromise on their beliefs. And even knowing that these beliefs have no concrete basis, they are holding on to them just because they have inherited them. Including wrong concept of God, spouse, children, friends, relatives, boss. And the list can be even, we can add more to it. The whole point is that we should see that what is the priorities within our mind and does hereafter and that concept of Allah finds any place anywhere in it. And you will be surprised that all those non-Quranic minds will have nothing as far as the hereafter is concerned or, the, or their own accountability is concerned or the concept of Allah. And they don't even think about it. In order to check these contents, we can do this by pausing to reflect on our past few years of life i.e. What, what did we pursue? What was the aim of this pursuit? Did it include the Quranic value system or was it all outside the values of the book? Then the next question we need to ask is that if I die tonight and never rise from my bed tomorrow, do I possess that self to which the Quran invites our attention? Have I checked it using the Quranic criteria or not? I put it down over here not only to remind myself but I thought we should think about these things and then motivate ourselves that wherever we are still lacking in understanding the system of deen, we should make some effort in our own time as well. Verse 1743, continuing, human self-development needs a higher self as a model. Let us look at the verse more closely. Quran says, Subhana wa ta'ala amma yakuluna. Whatever people say, Allah is beyond that. And this is about the false concepts people have about their own God. And he is such whose obedience needs to be adopted in order to bring out those potentials which are linked to supremacy, elevation, loftiness and ascendancy. And we will see to that in subsequent uh, slide. Becoming that human being who can carry out the task which Allah wishes us to accomplish by becoming his companions. So when we go through these verses, we should relate it to what Allah is asking us to reflect from our own personality so that we can carry out those duties which Allah is asking us to do on his behalf. And we have gone through a number of these responsibilities in our previous presentations. Here the Quran is asking us to replace the contents of our mind with this concept so that we acquire the correct Quranic concept of Allah. For example, there's a verse in Surah Al Imran, Wala tahinu, wala tazanu, wa antumul alauna in kuntum mu'mineen. So lose not heart, nor fall into despair, for you will gain superiority if you are mu'mineen. See the same word, alone, very high, a, a superlative degree of superiority. And superiority not in terms of putting other human beings down, but superiority in terms of acquiring a very high level of eminence and loftiness in our character. Then the verse sums up the meaning of Allah Akbar by sta stating Aluvan Kabira. Follow the guidance of this book and never give up. The results will show that the path being followed is the correct one. And those things will, ourselves we will realize that how much good is coming out of our personality, how many pure, how much purified thoughts we have acquired in the light of the Quran. This is just like becoming a doctor. We have to go through 
a procedure of five, six years, and then subsequent training to become a doctor. We cannot become a doctor unless we have followed that procedure. Same is the students of the Quran. If they want to become mu'mineen, they have to go through this procedure of coming to grips with the responsibilities of which Allah has taken on himself, and we have to deliver them in the human uh, world. And then we have to acquire all these abilities over a period of time in the context of system of deen. And another interesting point which came to my mind while I was putting these slides together was that when we die, since the next world is not going to be physical, so even if we are doctor, because once somebody has become a doctor, that becomes part of his self. And that self will rise up as doctor in the hereafter, but since that training will be of no use in the hereafter, so because it's a non-physical world. Similarly, Quran is asking us to acquire a moment self, just like becoming a doctor, so that we have that self which not only helps transform this life into the system of deen, but when it rises up, it fits into that system of deen, which is already in place in the hereafter. So this is an important aspect which we should keep in mind that while one is becoming a doctor, dentist, businessman, whatever in this life in order to earn a living, even within the man-made system, if we over and above that, we acquire a moment self, then essentially we are doing our best for the system of deen in this life. And then in the hereafter, automatically with that self, we will be of use to the next life. This is possible by acquiring the Quranic psyche with complete Iman in its guidance that it will take us where it promises to take us. Why? Because it is from Allah who ensures success when he, his laws are followed. So it is not otherworldly that somehow we will not know whether our self is developing or not. We have gone through this aspect previously as well, but if we look at the Quran, it is clearly signposted for the moment self. 1744, the universe around us demonstrates the existence and functioning of Allah's laws. To sabbe ho lahu samawato as sab o wal ardo wa man fi hinna wa immen shayin illa yu sabbe ho bihamdehi wala kinla tafkahuna tasbiya hum inna hukana haliman gafura. Whatever is in the highs and lows of the universe and whatever is within them are all busy functioning for the completion of the program defined by Allah. There is no such thing here which is not functioning for the completion of that program whose outcomes appear in front as living evidence of the praises and appreciation of Allah. But you do not understand how these are busy in carrying out these assigned duties. This is because the level of your knowledge about the universe is still very low. When you gain knowledge about it, then you will yourselves acknowledge that none among these has the potential to become Allah. With his patient and persevering forces, Allah is keeping the management of the universe in his control with an extremely firm hold and is protecting it in every manner so that chaos and disorder do not appear anywhere in it. Further reflections on this verse. We can see how this verse follows on from the previous verse and provides evidence of the supremacy of the laws of Allah. Everything in the universe follows his laws. Another important aspect is noted by stating that whatever is within this, here we need to pause and reflect on another aspect of seven noted in the verses. What the size and extent of the universe is forms part of the quest of human thought and science is trying to figure out whether we live in a one gigantic universe which appears to be infinite or are there multiverses. And a lot has appeared in the literature and even if we see new scientists, it has many articles whether there, is, there are multiverses in the universe or there is only one universe. One may say that what difference does it make to me as my own stay here is minuscule and the extent of the universe really does not matter to me. And this kind of a question and, and answer can cross our mind. However, the question which comes to mind is why did the Quran document this when it could easily have been left out? So that is something important for us as students of the Quran that why did Quran mention it? Despite the fact that our mind functions within a finite time scale, as far as this life is concerned, 
and we find it hard to conceive of something which is infinite or eternal or both. Allah being the creator did include such information in order to address some part of our natural curiosity as a sign so that we can look at the importance of our creation and develop our thought process further to solve human problems. And there are a number of verses in the Quran which deal with the outer universe and stellar bodies and, and the laws in the physical domain. In any case, the quest in this direction is freely available to us. We are free to think about anything. There is no harm in thinking about it because it does contribute to the vastness of our own consciousness. Outlining few issues related to the concept of Allah. I gave it some thought and said that let us make it a bit more interesting by questioning some aspects of the Quran. Firstly, Allah has informed us that He is always present and has no beginning and no end. For example, Quran says in Surah Hadid, Ho wal awwal ho wal akhiru. That is, He is the beginning and He is the end, which means He was always there and He will always be there. Which leads to this conclusion that since He creates, hence He is always creating, which then means we should never try to put some kind of human scale of finitude on His creation. Very important for us that we should never ever try to say that there was one point where there, there was no universe and then it start taking shape. There was no po such point as far as the Quran is concerned. How does this benefit us? It benefits us greatly as by becoming his companion we can remain assured that the quest we have initiated for gaining full, further knowledge will always have something more to explore on this journey of ourself. And this is part of Rububiyat. That is why Quran has not pointed to any end point in the development of ourself. And it says that you follow Allah on Sarat Mustaqeem. That is Rububiyat. And Rububiyat means that our self will keep developing. What is the extent to which it will ultimately develop? We do not know. It remains undefined. Secondly, Allah is everywhere. Wahuwa maakum aina maakuntum. Again, it is in Surah Hadith which means whatever the extent of his universe is and whatever is within it, his presence is essential. He's simply not detached from his creation. Very reassuring. What does this mean for us? By opting to follow this path of his, we wish to be assured we will never be abandoned on this path. And this can come across our minds that all the efforts which we are doing, for example, towards understanding the system of deen and coming to grips with that and doing solid deeds, Will we be left alone? And the Quran says, no way you will be left alone. Keep working and then see how the results appear in your life. And firstly, the results, of course, appear within our own psyche, which gets becomes better and better with every passing week, with every passing month, with every passing year. While stating that his laws will not leave us alone, it becomes more reassuring that he is there to have his laws obeyed. For example, we have gone through this verse previously as well when uh, Hazrat Musa was going to confront uh, Pharaoh and he felt some fear in his heart and the Quran says Kala la takhafa inna ni maakuma asma huwa ara and which means that do not have fear do not have fear because that is Allah himself will be listening to it and will also be watching it will also be observing that is his confrontation with Pharaoh will be observed by Allah Himself because Wahuwa Makum Aina Makuntum, He is with you wherever you are. Can there be anything more reassuring than Iman in this statement of fact? And there's a lot on this aspect within the Quran as we go through it and we can relate to our own existence in 2024. Continuing on this verse, 1744, thirdly, there has to be creation of all kinds in his universe or universes as it is in the nature of a self-possessing choice and intent to keep creating. So if Allah is avvalo wal akhiru, that means he is creating, he is always creating. This creation has to be for a higher purpose. Hence, even if we do not yet find another planet with human beings or a similar creation on it, this does not mean that it is not in existence. How does it affect us? Because this is another important aspect that why should we worry about it? Why should it find access to our cognition? The Quran has pointed to this fact in this verse, 
min dabbatin wa huwa la jamihim iza yashau qadir and among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the living creatures that he has scattered through them and he has power to gather them together as per his law of mushiyat another aspect noted in the verse is wala kin la tafkahuna tasbihahum we need to make an effort to understand the functioning of various aspects of the universe what it says over here is that you do not know how other uh, things are following his laws but that means that we should make an effort it is not that uh, you cannot find it out and we should not take it that way because quran is asking us to gain knowledge access to these aspects broadens our vision and we can also draw benefits for mankind wherever it is possible because the quran is asking us to broaden our vision to broaden the sphere domain of our consciousness so that we can understand the human problems more clearly the verse concludes with two divine attributes which point to the friendliness of the universe i e innahu kana haliman ghafura the universe is designed in such a way that it can tolerate and provide protection for many of our mistakes very important hali means something which is very tolerant the laws are the law of respite gives us time to mend our ways we can always go back to that point where we had taken the wrong turn in life and ghafur means of course it provides protection as well security as well and these two aspects we should reflect from our personalities as well in dealing with other human beings this provides guidance for the establishment of the system of deen now over here i have drawn a schematic which i thought will add some um, some color to our presentation today handing the word back to allah by following the quran Now this is the word planet here. From if we look at it from the space, Allah handed over planet Earth to man for a finite physical life, and we know that this whole planet is handed over to human beings to do whatever they want to do in this life. He is at liberty to use his choice and intent and create any man-made system. The law of cause and effect will let him know if his choices and decisions are good for him or not. He is invited to create a new life within him based on the development of his self, and this new life about it we can only learn through the wahi of Allah. Otherwise, people think that the life will end with death. Allah then sent His guidance as wahi via different messengers to provide man with the choice to avoid the evil effects of man-made systems and obtain the benefit of balance and order in His world, just like the outer universe. So, Quran. told us that if you want order and balance in your world just like the outer world which is beyond your domain then you should come to the path of wahi and here allah has handed over planet to us over here it is asking mu'minin to hand it back to allah by following his laws so it is an interesting equation to which we should pay some attention and i paid this attention and i said wait a minute Allah has handed this over and now he is asking us to hand it back so that we follow his laws and then get all the benefits associated with order and balance in the world and bring order and balance within our own life as well through the system of deen this guidance is now preserved and protected for all times in the Quran it is man's choice to follow this guidance willingly and thus get all the benefits associated with this obedience If he does not accept this guidance then man essentially has only one choice and we can see that human beings only have one choice without the Quran it is the Quran which provides another choice to us keep following man made laws which are based on this assumption that human life ends with physical death in following the Quran we hand over planet earth back to Allah i.e his laws and here i have quoted a verse وَهُوَ الَّذِي فِي السَّمَاءِ إِلَاهٌ وَفِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَاهٌ Now this is the statement of fact. What Quran is saying is that He is the one whose laws, He is Allah in the heavens, that is in the outer world, as well as He is Allah within the human world. And we can see that death will come to everyone. Whether we like it or don't like it, it is a fact of life. So wherever His laws are working, for example, in our physical body, His laws are working. And in If we for example do not follow 
those laws clearly physical laws for example not keep our diet properly keep smoking drinking and do not have healthy way of living then we will leave this world probably earlier than many others iman in the hereafter as a criterion this is the next verse wa iza qara'at al qur'ana ja'alna bainaka wa bain al ladina la yu'minuna bil akhirati hijaban mastura those people who approach the quran with a prior feeling of aversion in their hearts and do not have iman in the life of the future their condition is such that when you present the quran before them there is such a psychological veil drawn between you and those people which cannot be seen through ordinary eyes further reflections on this verse 1745 this verse makes us understand the finest aspects of the human psyche and as students of the quran it can save us from many distractions and false hopes which we attach to people who are not interested in the quran despite appearing to be its keen students those who precisely acquire iman as defined by the quran a desire arises within their hearts and minds as beneficiaries of this change that others should also be invited to its guidance so it is a positive sign within us if we have acquired iman that we want others to join in this uh, different way of living in 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 the world and to work for the system of deen Here Allah guides us about not making the assumption that the change which we have experienced through this guidance will be acceptable to others. The Quran has informed us that if if iman does not contain the element of conviction in the hereafter then merely saying a few words and showing some interest in reading it or listening to it will not bring about any change in people. Why does it happen that something which is obvious to one individual is not so obvious to another one? Continuing Here the Quran has factually stated that those who listen to the Quran but do not have iman in the hereafter there appears to be an invisible veil between them and the Quran and the moment who is communicating it and we experience it because when we pass on the message to others who are not interested we will see that sometimes they show their disinterest as well but we can see that it is not making any sense to them whatever is being explained to them in the light of the quran they will endlessly talk about the man made system and its bad points and its evil side but once we invite them to the quran they refuse to come to the quran why is this veil invisible and can we make it visible that is if we look at the verse in reverse order in order to make it visible we need to come to grips with the new psyche within us based on iman and understand the higher purpose of life to which the quran draws our attention on a continual basis without acquiring a logical understanding of the existence of the life of the hereafter not just as a barely a belief or a concept oh yes there is a life in the hereafter the quran is asking us to concentrate on it and get evidence for it within our own psyche first and then its acceptance the importance of the system of deen and its basis cannot be grasped in the absence of this constituent of iman this life of ours becomes only animalistic and we do not recognize the existence of ourselves and its need for further development it also means that if people say verbally that they have iman in the hereafter we need to explore this aspect further as noted in 1736 i.e. to gain knowledge about this we shouldn't leave it there we should probe it of course tactfully we can speak to people and ask them what exactly they mean by having belief in the hereafter and then we can relate it to what is noted in the quran and we can point their direction to it if they are willing to listen to it in another verse the quran cautions us by stating wa min an-nas may yaqulu amanna billahi wa bil yawm al-akhir wa ma hum bi mu'minin of the people there are some who say we have iman in allah and the hereafter but they do not have iman 1746 next verse important aspects of human psyche wajalna ala qulubihim aqinnatan an yafqahu ho wa fi azanihim waqran wa iza zakarta rabbaka fil quran wahdahu wallahu ala adbarihum nafura and such covers are drawn over their hearts due to which their intellect and reasoning is of no use to them and in their ears are such plugs due to which the truthful matter simply does not reach their heart 
The emotions of hatred make man blind and deaf like this. It is the outcome of these emotions of hatred that when you mention one Allah alone in the Quran and do not associate their battle gods and religious clergy with him, they turn their faces away and leave. This is the last verse so of our today's presentation. Further reflections. Continuing on from the previous verse where Iman in the hereafter is highlighted as a sign of possessing Iman, here the Quran has drawn our attention to two important aspects of the use of the heart and mind. In order to acquire conviction, we need to involve both our intellectual side as well as emotive side, otherwise we cannot benefit from the Quranic guidance. And we have used the example from our day-to-day -day life as well, that if we understand something of benefit to us, but are not motivated to go for that benefit, then we cannot get that benefit. So first we should understand it intellectually and then emotively bring out that motivation within us, create a desire and a need for that and then go after it. And if these two are not there, then we cannot achieve our purpose. The use of our senses helps us to gain information through our perceptive abilities and then we take this further and convert it into knowledge. If people do not find an appeal in the message of the Quran, then we need to figure out the psyche behind this rejection or lack of acceptance. If we can understand the process of the acceptance of our own Iman, then we can relate this to others. All of us possessing the same self means that if we understand our own psyche, then if we try, we can relate this to others. Why do people not like the completeness of the Quran as the book of guidance from Allah? Firstly, they do not feel the need for it because they consider the beliefs they hold to be adequate for their needs. I went through these points and I thought that it is better to again share these. We do have, we have gone through some of this previously as well. Mostly such people are the beneficiaries of man-made systems. What do they think they will get by accepting it as a complete book of guidance? And they think they will get nothing out of it. Continuing, secondly, when they see clearly to what the Quran is inviting them, they do not wish to abandon their unbridled desires and prefer to keep following these, even if these contribute to injustices and imbalances in the world. And we have seen that people continuously talk about these injustices and imbalances and what is, for example, going through, going in the world in Gaza to Palestinian people. They will talk endlessly about it, but once we present the solution from the Quran, they are not interested in it. For example, in verse 45-23, Quran says, Afaraita minatta khaza ilahahu hawahu. Then do you see such a one as takes his own vain desire as his God? Because they do not want to give up their own desires, which are lying outside the guidance of the Quran. Thirdly, they wish to conform to the majority and the argument they use is that how can so many people go wrong despite living in a grossly unjust world. The Quran counters this line of thinking by presenting evidence from the court of knowledge and it says, And this helps us because if we are looking for majority to change and start following the Quran, the Quran says it's not possible. The reason is that most of the people want to conform to the majority around us. Even if when the system of deen comes in, people will, those who following the system of deen and who are willingly accepted the system of deen will always be in minority. And this is the way human psyche functions. Another verse, if you are to follow the majority and the word, they will lead you away from the path of Allah. And to understand this psyche by the students of the Quran is part of our responsibility to understand it. Why do, do, do people do that? And we will come to this conclusion that most of the people find it very hard to start thinking rationally and using their reasoning power. They want an easy course in life because this is the way their desire is. Fourthly, it is an individual choice. If someone does not wish to seek guidance and protection from the dangers of this life, then he simply cannot go for it. Fifthly, if people are committing wrongs and, and injustices, then they will never come to the Quran because they like doing wrong. If somebody is doing wrong, then he or she is not going to come to the guidance of the Quran because it will not appeal to them because they will have to stop doing those wrongs. 
The reason is clear that a contaminated psyche simply cannot give space to the concept of Allah as noted in the Quran. Life can only come to our psyche when we make ourselves aware of the lifeless contents residing in it. Finally, some concluding remarks. These are some of the signs which can help us to communicate the message of the Quran to others. Even those people who study the Quran academically admit that there are aspects in which in it which simply cannot be the product of the human thought process. They also notice the uniqueness of its language and the power behind its statements, i.e. the way its verses address mankind and mu'mineen. However, their minds do not go beyond the basic level of thinking and they do not see its contents as providing guidance on organizing our world based on its permanent values. I put down this comment through my own observation that a lot of even Western thinkers who talk about the Quran, they do not see the system of deen in it. They do not see that concept of Allah which helps to develop our own self. And they also do not recognize their own self which has the ability or the potential to go beyond death. All their thinking is that the life ends with death and with that assumption in mind they study the Quran. The Quran has pointed to this aspect here that when one and only Allah is mentioned as sovereign whose laws should be obeyed, they dislike this and are unwilling to consider this option because they like the man-made systems and they are quite happy to live, live within the man-made system. For example, in verse 3945, It's worth looking at the rest of the verse as well. When Allah, the one and only, is mentioned, the hearts of those who have no iman in the hereafter are filled with disgust and horror. We witness this kind of reaction and behavior from people across the world. For example, just watch on the media how many of them ever refer to human accountability and the possibility of life beyond physical death. And according to the Quran, this is a starting point for anyone to think of seeking guidance from it. Even after this start, many years of study and hard work lie ahead on this journey called sirat e mustaqim Just like becoming a doctor and, and any professional being in the human system, we should also look at the Quran that for becoming a mu'mineen, we need rest of our life to work on it and we need an intense focus on, on these verses and try to bring change within us and try to see that how the world is functioning around us. Thanks for your time and for sharing this today. Please feel free to share it with your contacts. You may like to subscribe for future talks related to the Quranic system of Deen. Thank you.